Hi everyone, my name is Adam Wallace. I'm a senior security software engineer at NVIDIA. I've been here for three years. I have a focus on DevOps and applications development. I'd like to talk today a little bit about how NVIDIA is working to secure containers, not only within our infrastructure, but also those that we get to deliver to our customers. I'm gonna talk a little bit about NVIDIA's background and history, uh, and then also our NGC container catalog. I'm also going to talk about our approach to security, sort of some of the practical ways that we're approaching security with those containers. And then I'm going to wrap up at the end with uh, bring your own policy. So many know us for the graphics card. You know, we've been synonymous with graphics cards pretty much since the invention of the graphics card. It's been a really important core business for decades, you know, with a focus on gaming. But there's been a shift over the last you know, decade or so. The importance of the GPU has really changed in that there have been massive pushes into machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence. It's pushing these incredibly complicated systems directly to the consumer. With these pushes, it really changes the way that we look at the graphics card and how we support the graphics card. This is a full software stack that is required in order to support the new development. And it changes the way that we have to look at securing this stack, not only internally, but for our customers. NGC is an exciting service that we offer. It's a catalog. Um, it's a catalog of toolkits that enable and accelerate machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence. The catalog offers a few key features, um, some of which are storing Docker images, so it is a full Docker registry. Uh, it allows storage of Helm charts for your different Kubernetes workloads. It allows storage of artificial intelligence models. This really helps you get off the ground quickly if you're new to AI uh, with models that are proven to work. This is all done with the goal of simplifying the effort required to enable GPU optimized workloads. Additionally, a private registry is offered. This is so that enterprises or teams can collaborate within a private space and store their different Docker images, Helm charts, et cetera, uh, that they're maybe not ready to share or don't have the intention of sharing. Uh, we use Encore Enterprise as part of NGC to help scan for security issues and let our customers know what sort of vulnerabilities might be uh, you know, applicable to them within the images that they're deploying. You can see a link in the bottom right there for more information on NGC. So often security gets a bad rap. What happens is, you know, it's three days to a, a release cycle, a developer comes to us and realizes they have a bunch of security problems they didn't address or weren't even aware of. You know, they want us to drop everything and help them right away. And hopefully this doesn't actually come out of our mouths in security, but you know, the snarky response would be something like, sure, I'm not doing anything else. I'll just, you know, help you and drop everything else I'm doing. Uh, and by the way, you're probably going to have a bunch of issues that you won't have time to fix, and you'll have to decide to either, you know, ship with them and acknowledge the risk there, or you're going to have to delay your release, which no developer wants to hear, no program manager wants to hear. So this presentation is really more about moving from the end of the process and shifting left as part of your uh, thought in your development life cycle. You know, a view of this is as development starts kicking off, you know, you can think of rapid prototyping and development of software, um, probably not even really testing it. Um, things start off kind of hot and heavy, start moving down this hill that we have here. And you realize ah, I should be unit testing. So you kind of bolt that on after the development, start improving your code coverage a little bit. You know, you move on to integration testing to make sure that the different components really sort of interact together as expected. Um, you know, start moving down the hill. This is where you might really hit your first big hiccup in that based on your different team's review styles, you might have, uh, you know, a lot of feedback that is based on opinion. Maybe that's coding style. Maybe true problems are found or corner cases that weren't anticipated or brought up. And you have to go back and now readdress all the three phases we just talked about. Finally, you make it through that phase, you get to the point where you're ready to merge, and then you think about security, you know? And as a security team, we don't wanna be the police. We wanna be a partner. We wanna pro provide guardrails and not gates. So how can we help these teams? You know, are we just plugging in after the merge point looking for security problems? Well, I think you know the answer is probably no. It's a little late in the game to do that. So as you can imagine, we keep moving up the hill here, trying to look for the best places to plug in. 
And the best place to start is at the beginning. So some of the practical ways we can look at hooking in is described in this graphic here. So we'll start off in the first bucket, talking about your code. You know, open source screening as described down there might be something like static analysis checkers. This is looking for, uh, you know, basic security checks, making sure that you're writing secure code. This isn't gonna catch everything, but it's a really good thing to automate. This is also reviewing your open source dependencies, looking for known open source problems and vulnerabilities directly in the source code repository. This can be done potentially even at the directly at the developer's workspace, potentially in their code editor. So think about like a VS code plugin that offers some sort of a static analysis or security code plugin. If they can be alerted before they ever even commit the code, they get the opportunity to address it right up front. Moving on to the build phase. This is running scans and checks as part of every merge request or even better, every commit. Um, this isn't just security. This can be code formatting, linting, type checking, for example, MyPy and Python, in addition to those security scans. This is probably your best time to evaluate your, your dependencies. This is not just your direct dependencies. So in Python, if you, you ask for the request library to be part of your package, you're also indirectly or transitively requesting URL lib3 and a bunch of other different Python packages. So this is evaluating your direct and your transitive dependencies. Um, also committing those lock files directly into your source code repo so that you understand the artifacts that you are intending to ship. Um, these dependency files might not be published in your final artifact, and I would even argue they probably shouldn't be. So this might be your best and only time to really evaluate those dependencies against what's expected. Moving on to packaging, you know, we're at KubeCon, so the obvious thought here is Docker. This is combining all of the artifacts into a singular package, view, container, whatever you want to say, um, that you're going to deliver to the customer. Um, th these artifacts that you have done in the previous two fill, uh, stages of the build really need to be looked at through the lens of the operating environment. And what I mean by that is, if you're using a package, for example, let's say you rely on libssl, whether or not libssl is running in Ubuntu versus Red Hat has security implications. It may have been patched in one environment and not the other. So it's important to look at it through that lens. Um, also, this is a great time to look at the artifacts that were actually built into the container and compare them to the dependency lists that you published in the previous stage. Do the direct and transitive dependencies that you requested, did those actually show up in the container? What other dependencies are now showing up, for example, from the operating system in the container that you've chosen to deploy from? Moving on to release. This is hopefully just a set of checks and balances uh, you know, that the previous stages that we've already talked about meet the certifications that your team has to adhere to. This should tie back through all three of those stages. Moving on to config. Um, ideally, your configuration is being stored and treated as code. Uh, for example, you know, let's say you're using Terraform to keep track of your AWS security groups. Those should be tracked and committed as code that describes your expected state. So as we move on to monitoring, you can check and see if there's any sort of drift in your configuration. Um, you want to make sure that there is no drift. And if there is drift, you need to know, do you, do you know how to alert the appropriate parties? Do you actually have alerting in place so that you could contact those parties in an automated fashion? This is just a quick view of an internal tool that we develop uh, within my team called Inspect. It's sort of a product security catalog. The idea is to give you a single pane view of your risk posture against your bill of materials. Um, this is not tied to just one single scanning tool on the back end. It combines multiple tools and gives you this single pane. It allows you to see different CVEs against some of your open source dependencies, et cetera. Um, it also allows you to sort based on vulnerabilities and give an idea of what linked packages are providing those so that we can work with the teams and see if those vulnerabilities really apply to them. Oftentimes you'll find that a vulnerability doesn't apply because of the way it was deployed or because they're not using certain functionality that only that CVE applies to. Moving on to container security. Um, as many of you here are probably uh, dealing with, NVIDIA is also dealing with containers at scale. You know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of individual container digests that we care about. 
thousands of containers that must be scanned every day. And I don't know what it is about machine learning, deep learning, and AI containers that are so complicated, but for some reason, they tend to be large. You know, I'm talking 20 gigabytes or more. And as you know, that's pretty large for a Docker image. So there's challenges that come along with these large containers. Um, but however, having all these things containerized really do bring some exciting possibilities and new risks and considerations to any developer on how this code is being deployed. This is definitely not an all-encompassing list of those challenges, but just a few I wanted to highlight. Tags are not immutable. This is probably not news to anybody on this call, but a tag is just a pointer to a digest. And while that digest is immutable, a tag is intentionally changeable. It's a feature and one that we all rely on, really. It allows easy updates to the consumers of your container. But based on the fact that tags are not immutable, reliance on tagging strategies really can introduce risk if you're not paying attention. This can really uh, range from a developer changing a, uh, the contents of a container out from underneath of you. This might be unintentional, it could be careless or even malicious. But other times, this might be a very intentional change uh, that the developer you know, wanted to have in the container. They've been broadcasting it, but perhaps your team hasn't been paying attention to their release notes or you're just not paying attention at all and you're not ready for those changes. Uh, in, the, in the context of Kubernetes, your different pull policies can affect whether or not you're pulling the latest and greatest containers down at all. You might be stuck in a really old container image because your Kubernetes uh, deployment has reference to an old image and you've been telling it not to update it. Often Docker daemons uh, that are shipped with popular distributions don't enable user namespacing by default. So you might be over provisioning access to the containers that run within your infrastructure. This is granting uh, increased you know, privilege to resources on the host that you may not wish to deploy. We've already talked a little bit about some of NVIDIA's large Docker images, but you know, scanning these containers bring additional challenges. It requires more CPU, more memory, and more disk space as compared to just a regular static analysis code checker. Um, not to mention secrets and sensitive data. Right? I actually believe it's easier within containers to accidentally leave a secret or something sensitive in a container than it is to properly leave it out during a build. There's a lot of ways to mess it up. It's a huge risk to an organization if an API token or an encryption key is accidentally left within a container and it gets published. And a container digest can persist forever. But a tag of latest, as you know, induces a false sense of security. That container might be the latest, but it might be three years old and not be receiving regular updates at all. So scanning these containers really grants us some unique considerations. Packages and artifacts can be inspected in the environment in which it will actually run. So for example, you can validate that a compiled binary and the linkages, so for example, the libraries it relies on, uh, exists within the container and meets the expectations the developer had. Scanning those packages, I talked about this before though, uh, before, gives you the ability to look through a lens to reduce false positives. So if Ubuntu has in fact patched a version of libSSL and you're using that container, you don't wanna see all the CVEs that don't apply to you in your list. It's extra noise that you don't wanna deal with. Containers should also be continually checked against the feeds for ever growing lists of vulnerabilities. Uh, the different feeds we have access to from NVD, from Red Hat, Ubuntu, et cetera, they're updated practically daily, um, sometimes hourly. So you can't just set and forget. Um, you need to constantly monitor and be aware of the vulnerability posture that you have against your deployed code. One of the exciting changes to the uh, version two of Docker registry was this um, multi-architectural support under a single tag name. It's really nice from an organizational standpoint because you can have a single tag that covers both ARM64, for example, and AMD64 but that also introduces the challenge of uh, knowing the risks associated with each of the container images that rely within that tag. You might have a vulnerability that only affects ARM, but doesn't affect Intel or AMD64. So some of the ways that we're approaching this in NVIDIA, um, I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit and talk about sort of the evolution of like how we've tried to approach this. Initially, we really tried to um, use uh, this sort of decentralized approach directly in developers' pipelines. We used Anchor's open source engine, um, which allowed the scan store right in the pipeline. So it was nice. Each team could use their own resources to handle it. The results were also captured directly as artifacts 
in the team's pipelines, but they weren't really restored in some sort of common database or an API where like the security team could go and query the security posture of different teams. So the, the next logical step was purchasing Incore Enterprise um, and deploying our Incore scanners within the SaaS endpoint uh, within Kubernetes. Um, a lot of benefits here, really, like you have a centralized API where you can retrieve those results. It's constantly refreshing the feed databases so that you can, if you ever need to check your security posture against certain policies and checks that you have deployed, you can get those on a practically real-time basis. But there were some drawbacks to this approach. Uh, we had to store Teams API tokens uh, within our SaaS instance so that we had access to different private registries that Teams have within NVIDIA. Um, performance can also be a bottleneck if a whole bunch of teams queue up at the same time and could cause, uh, you know, a, a tremendous slowdown in pipelines. So some of what we're working towards now is that kind of decentralized plus SaaS architecture. This is using the open source product by Incore called SIFT, which generates a bill of materials within Teams pipeline. So the heavy lifting of generating the bill of materials is done within the Teams pipelines. And then SIFT uh, promotes that bill of materials back to the SAS endpoint for a quick processing to do a vulnerability check. Um, another advantage is that teams don't have to provide any credentials at all, since SIFT is operated within their infrastructure, and that's where the image is in intro or inspected, I mean. Um, it gives us the advantage of not needing those credentials. So we sort of retain the benefits of SAS API for the catalog, vulnerabilities on demand without having to have a whole bunch of infrastructure with SAS to support it. We allow each team to scale as they need to based on their number of images. So continuing along this whole idea of guardrails and not gates, you know, we realized pretty quickly that policies were not a one size fits all sort of uh, idea for different teams. So, we do want to provide guidance and a sane set of default policies for teams. You know, this, rely, uh, this is along the lines of vulnerabilities. So certain CVE scores, you know, we might want to mark as critical or high and not allow a pipeline to pass. This is looking for secrets and credentials, perhaps stored within the different layers of an image. This might be internal or secret project names that we're not quite ready to get Twitter or Reddit excited over. Uh, malware, so we can do malware scans in the different images um, as part of same defaults. Uh, and even things like looking for, you know, mistakes, typos, or even typo squatting that might be released in an image that might direct uh, customers' traffic to incorrect domains. So what we really want to do here, though, at NVIDIA is encourage each team to sign off on their set of policies that are appropriate to their program commit these policies as code directly within their uh, source code repositories and keep track of it. Um, and then we allow them to submit that to our SAS endpoint to evaluate their, their risk uh, posture. This really allows us sort of on the fly policy um, and has really you know, worked out well for our team so far. So as I'm wrapping up, I just wanna talk about like how we're trying to support developers in NVIDIA how we're trying to make their lives, um, how to, to help them without inhibiting them. So one of the first things we look at when we uh, investigate a new tool is sort of its API posture. So we're API first. We use a variety of build tools uh, that developers are already comfortable with. And by build tools, I'm talking more, more along the lines of pipelines. So Jenkins, GitLab, CI, CD, GitHub Actions, Team City. So we're working in a variety of environments. So APIs are really important. Teams don't have the uh, time or the luxury to learn a new UI tool for every single tool we roll out. And even worse, we know they're not gonna be checking on any sort of a reliable schedule to see if they're now vulnerable to some newly released CVE um, within that UI. So we have to use the API within their pipeline to query and return their results. We need robust APIs for the services deployed at NVIDIA. We wanna minimize the impact on development teams. Scan times have to be reasonable. If we're adding 15 minutes or even five minutes to a pipeline, developers are likely gonna start looking for ways to bypass our scans or reduce the frequency. Um, I mean, this just makes sense as a developer. You're on a tight schedule, you have a lot of work to get done. So we don't wanna slow them down. Um, kind of combined with that is alert fatigue. You know, We've really found that it's kind of productive to over alert teams receiving a Slack message for every different vulnerability report or every CVE 
is really just going to force them to invest more time in learning how to mute, uh, mute channels in Slack than it is going to be with them trying to fix their vulnerabilities. And then optimizing the signal to noise ratio. Every tool is going to generate some threshold of false positives or even worse, false negatives. So we're looking for tools that do a good job at trying to minimize that. That's why it's important to look at vulnerabilities against a vendor feed or against the operating system in which they run. It's a high priority for us and a primary consideration. Um, you know, the last thing I want to say is we just really want to provide these guardrails and not gates. Uh, you know, we work carefully and closely with our product security incident response team, and we help to uh, encourage teams and guide them through the process if a vulnerability is found within their products. We also help to provide a, a healthy set of guidelines to the team so that they don't all need to be experts on every facet of every tool that is provided to them. Just wrapping up here, uh, we're going to have a Q&A session now. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. If you have more interest in NGC, you can find a link here below. And if you're interested in SIFT for getting an idea of your uh, bill of materials, please check out the GitHub link below. Thanks for your time, everybody.